You might get questions on GED Science about human biology and health science. So in this video, I'm going to tell you what you need to know to help you pass GED Science faster so you can move ahead to whatever's next for you, whether it's college or a better job. So let's get started. And the first thing I want you to know about are vital signs. And vital signs are measurements of the body's essential functions. Now, you probably know what these are, whether you've heard the term uh, or not before. Because whenever you go to the doctor, this is one of the first things they mention at a checkup, right? They want to check your blood pressure, and they want to check your breathing, and it also includes your pulse and your temperature. So these are what the vital signs are. Now, you probably have heard before, but maybe not, it's okay if you haven't, that a normal blood pressure is about 120 over 80. The average breathing rate for a healthy adult, with some variation based on age, is 16 to 20 breaths per minute. And the normal adult pulse is gonna be in the range of 60 to 100 beats per minute. Do you know what the normal temperature is? Well, you've probably heard before that it's 98.6 and everybody's gonna be different, but these vital signs just give you a quick overview of your health and for a doctor or a nurse or whoever happens to be, um, it's just, they want to look at your vitals. It's just kind of a quick way to gauge someone's overall health. So that's what I want you to know about vital signs. And now it's time for a pop quiz. So it says, which reading, it says a patient presents with the following readings, a 120 over 80 blood pressure, a breathing rate of 18 breaths per minute, a pulse of 79 beats per minute, and a temperature of 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'd like you to answer, which reading should the doctor be most concerned with based only on the information that I provided? So pause the video, I'll try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, let's go over this. So the correct answer here is the temperature, right? And remember, the normal blood pressure is about 120 over 80. The breathing rate for an average healthy adult is 16 to 20 breaths per minute. The pulse is 60 to 100 beats per minute as well. I don't need you to remember those. I just want you to be aware of how to apply them here. And the key behind this is that everything else looks like it's in the normal range here, except for that temperature. The temperature is abnormal, it's too high. And given that we don't know anything about else about the patient, that, that's all that we have to go off of. That is the one vital that the doctor would be most concerned with here. Okay, let's keep moving. So we've now established what the normal vital signs are. But what happens when a reading is abnormal? Now, if a person's temperature, like we just said, is above 98.6, maybe 106 degrees or whatever, something like that, we'd say that that person has a fever. And typically, you get a fever because your body's trying to fight a bacteria or a virus that caused an infection. You now might be wondering, what's an infection? Well, an infection, it occurs when a germ, which could be a bacteria or a virus, invades your body and causes a disease. It could also be, you know, uh, something from uh, fungi, uh, a fungus or something can cause uh, you to become sick too. Um, but basically, uh, how do germs get in is the next thing that we're going to talk about now. So one way would be a breach in the skin, like a cut or a wound in the skin. It could also be through your eyes, through your ears and your nose. Uh, or food poisoning. Through the eyes, ears, and nose, these are all big ways that diseases get in, which is why they often recommend for you to, to wash your hands, right? Especially during the flu season and during, you know, what's going on in the world right now with, uh, you know, sickness. It's always good to wash your hands. The reason why is because, hey, if, if somebody is sitting at a table and they sneeze on the table or, you know, whatever, and you sit there, you touch where they sneezed, and then you touch your eye without washing your hands, you can give the germs a free ride into your body through your eyes, your ears, and your nose, all right? So, you know, your body has these defense mechanisms in place to try to prevent germs from invading, and these are just some of the ways here that the body has. What happens if, like I just said in that last example, if you you, you get a germ, you get something on your hand, right, and you, you touch your eye, or you touch your, you put your finger in your mouth or something, are you guaranteed to get sick? Well, the answer is no in most cases. Uh, you might get sick from that, but you might not. And the reason is, one of the reasons is because there's enzymes in your tears, all right, that can help keep these bacteria out. So just because you get something in your eye doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get sick. Same with your mouth. Just because you touch something that has a bacteria on it and you put your finger in your mouth, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get sick, all right, because saliva has enzymes that can help prevent the invader. 
And there's other methods your body has to as well, but these are just some I want to give you right here. But it's still obviously, common sense says it's better not to put your hands in your mouth, right? Unless you've washed them first. But I'm just saying, you know, it doesn't always mean you're going to get sick because your body has these mechanisms and defense mechanisms in place to try to protect you. What happens though if the germs invade and if they get past these defense mechanisms? Then your body has a system in place called the immune system that's going to respond. And I want you to think here about soccer. Whether you play soccer or not, I'm sure you know a little bit about how it works. It's similar to basketball, but you know, in soccer, there's a goalie, there's defenders. One team wants to kick the soccer ball ball into the goal and the defenders and the goalie and the other players on that and the other team want to stop the team from scoring. So your skin, your tears, and the saliva, think of them like the defenders. So they are basically right there to try to stop the ball from going into the goal. All right. Now your immune system is like the goalie. So if the defenders fail and the other team gets past the defenders, the goalie is still there to try to stop you from getting sick. The goalie is still there to try to stop the ball from entering the net. And that's kind of analogous to the immune system. And the example is not perfect, but hopefully it helps you understand the point here. And I want you to note that your immune system makes antibodies to destroy antigens. Now, if you're wondering what these terms mean, don't worry because that's what we're going to cover now. An antigen is anything that causes your immune system to launch a response because your immune system doesn't recognize it. So going back to soccer here again, if one of the goalie's own teammates comes close to the goal and they have the ball, the goalie's not going to respond to that. The goalie's not going to launch a defensive attack against the own goalie, all right? Just like the immune system is not typically going to attack something that it recognizes, unless it's an autoimmune disease, in which case the body attacks itself, basically, but that's not what we... We don't need you to know about that for the GED, but I'm just saying, very generally speaking here, understand that the goalie is only going to respond and launch a defense if one of the players from the other team is getting close to the goal with the ball. The goalie is not going to defend against the, the own teammates, against their own teammates. Again, the opposing players are like those antigens. Once the antigens get close, the goalie doesn't recognize them as being on their own team, so the goalie launches a defense. And it's the same type of idea here. Not a perfect example, but... It just, I hope this drives the point home. Your immune system makes antibodies to counter these antigens. So you're not like defenseless here. And this brings us to the next topic, which is vaccines. Typically a vaccine is made with a dead or weakened version of a disease causing germ. And this triggers your immune system to produce antibodies and essentially trains your body to remember the invaders in the future, which is how a vaccine works. And this brings us to our next topic here too, which is what are antibiotics? So take a second here and maybe pause and just think, what do you know already about antibiotics? Anytime you can connect what you're about to learn to what you already know, it's going to enhance your comprehension, which will hopefully help you learn faster and get a better score. I'll tell you though what they are. They are medications that fight bacterial infections. Now this brings us to a phenomenon, which is really important to understand, called antibiotic resistance. So. Suppose that all these blue circles on the screen are bacteria in the body. Now suppose that randomly some of the bacteria get mutations in their DNA. The blue circles with the black dots represent the bacteria with the mutations. And suppose that the mutations just happen by chance to protect these bacteria against the antibiotic. Well, what's going to happen if a doctor prescribes the antibiotic? And the antibiotic, what it's going to do, it's going to kill and wipe out most of the bacteria, which is going to be good. The problem, though, is that some of the bacteria that are resistant, the antibiotic can't wipe them out. So in this case, the, the red X's just represent death, okay? They represent that some of the bacteria cells, in fact, in many cases, most will be wiped out by the antibiotic. But the mutated bacteria, which we see with the black dots, are, have mutations that make them protected against the antibiotic. So what do you think is going to happen? All right, we wipe out all of the bacteria that aren't resistant, leave, leaving the bacteria that are resistant here. They're going to re reproduce and multiply. Now what you're left with is a situation or a scenario that is kind of scary to think about, right? But this is true, unfortunately, where, you know, the bacteria that are mutated and the, won't respond to the antibiotics they're going to reproduce, they're going to multiply, and it's just going to leave you way more bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics. Now, I'm absolutely not saying this is not medical advice. 
if your doctor prescribes you antibiotics, you should do what your doctor says and take them, obviously. Always listen to your doctor. Okay, this isn't med medical advice. I'm just saying this is a real phenomenon that can happen, all right? And it's, it's kind of scary because your body can stop responding to antibiotics after a while. Um, but this is known as antibiotic resistance. So switching gears here, we're going to next talk about nutrients. So I'd like you to, again, maybe pause for a second here and just think, what are nutrients? What do I know about them already? It's just a good practice to get into to help you just prime the pump for what's going to come. So let me give you the answer here. And nutrients, I'm sure you've heard of nutrients before, like you get nutrients in your food and stuff like that. But really, if you didn't know that, that's okay, perfectly okay. That's what I'm here is to teach you. Hopefully you'll learn. And hopefully you'll learn then that nutrients are there to provide nourishment to really help you grow and survive and thrive. So a well-balanced diet, which would be things like fruits and vegetables, etc., etc., is going to help you to get the nutrients that you need. Now, unfortunately, many people don't get a well-balanced diet, and myself included. That's one thing I'm always trying to improve is my diet, but I'll be honest from time to time, and sometimes a lot of the time, when I, especially when I'm really busy, my diet is not well-balanced, but it's always a good practice to have a well-balanced diet because you're going to get the proper amount of nutrients that you need for energy and for your general health overall, but uh, there's some people out there that are very good about nutrition, and that's a great thing. I aspire to be like that, but unfortunately, I've got a, quite a ways to go. Uh, but nutrients include carbs, fats, minerals, vitamins, and proteins, just to name some examples here. Common sense says that if you're not eating enough of the right foods, you're not going to get enough nutrients, and getting too few nutrients can cause you serious problems, right? And so one example is, there's an old book, it's called My Side of the Mountain, it's basically a story where... Uh, a kid runs away and goes off and lives in the woods. I think it's in Canada is where it takes place. And he goes and survives in the mountains. And there's a part of the book where he starts getting nosebleeds. And he thinks it's because of some vitamin that he's missing. And it turns out that it was lack of vitamin C that was causing the nosebleeds. And this is a condition called scurvy. All right. When you don't get enough vitamin C, you can get scurvy. And it can lead to nosebleeds as a result. So that's just one example of a condition that can come up. Um, now, also, it's not just getting too few of nutrients. It can also be getting too many. Now, when I was a little kid, all right, I had a friend, and somehow, you know how these, the Flintstone or the gummy vitamins, you know, you know how they have, like, childproof safety lids on them that make it hard to open? Somehow my friend got, got them opened, and or maybe they were left open by somebody else, and he ate way too many of them, and... I don't remember exactly what happened. I mean, he was okay. He lived to tell about it. He's still alive now, almost 20 years later. So he obviously survived. But I, I just remember my mom telling me as a kid, don't ever eat, eat too many gummy vitamins. Eat one or two or whatever is recommended. And that's it. Because your friend, so-and-so, you know, I'm not going to put him on blast in this video. But, you know, my mom told me, you know, he OD'd basically. He ate way too many vitamins. I think they had to call poison control. I, I honestly don't know what happened. But I know, like I said, he lived to tell about it. But... It can be very, very, very serious, and you know, especially something like taking way too much Tylenol or taking way too much of any medicine can be very, very serious. Can damage your organs, can even kill you. Um, but now we're up to another pop quiz here, and the question is, which of the following does your body produce in response to an invader? A, B, C, or D? Pause the video, try to remember, and then we'll go over it. So the answer here is antibodies. So just remember that the antibodies are produced in response to that invader. And the next question is, what is the name of a substance that invades the body and causes an immune response? A, B, C, or D? So pause the video now, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. So the answer here is B, antigen. And I was just going to say, we just had the definition of antibodies up there. Now we're talking about antigens. So just try to remember. It's not super important that you remember the exact definition. It would just be good to remember that the body makes antibodies in response to antigens, which are the foreign invaders that come into your body and cause a, an immune response. So that's the end of the video. Hope this was helpful. Hope you learned something here. You know, I'm mainly concerned with teaching you what you need to know to pass the GED test to move on to bigger and better things in life. For a lot of you, that's going to be college. I know that, but maybe it's a better job or just to feel good about yourself and have more personal satisfaction. That's a great thing too. But I hope this video helped you out and I really wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for watching.